Boston had a distinct role in the history of jazz, and in the 20th century, jazz becomes the American music. It's a form of music invented, developed in America, and some places are synonymous with jazz. New Orleans, Kansas City, Chicago, New York has a vivid jazz scene. Boston's in somewhat different, as there isn't a distinct Boston sound. Instead, musicians come from Boston to the rest of the, to influence jazz in other places, and musicians come to Boston. And really, the heart of Boston's jazz scene was Massachusetts Avenue and Columbus Avenue, really in the African American community of Boston along Columbus Ave and Mass Ave, which was the jazz corner of Boston. This area had a lot of boarding houses. The old mansions had become boarding houses of a transient population and clubs foster a community for men and women who are passing through. Also an African-American community here. And in addition, there is a musical community, the Schillinger House, formed in the 1940s, which becomes, under the leadership of Lawrence Burke, the Berkeley College of Music. The New England Conservatory also is one of the foremost trainers of musicians in the country. So we have a critical mass of musicians and a critical mass of an audience for musicians. And here at places like the Savoy Cafe or the Hi-Hat, we have premier jazz entertainment. The Pioneer Lounge becomes an after-hours place for jazz musicians to go and you might see Duke Ellington or Sarah Vaughan or Ella Fitzgerald performing at one of these venues. You also have some prominent musicians, Harry Carney and Johnny Hodges, who really are the heart of the Duke Ellington Orchestra, both from Roxbury. Roy Haynes, a drummer, who plays with Lester Young, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, Sarah Vaughan, comes from Roxbury. Musicians who influence the course of jazz in the rest of the country. One of the most noted empresarios, George Ween from Newton, opens Storyville in the late 40s, early 50s in Copley Square, and he in the mid-50s will form the Newport Jazz Festival and becomes one of the leading promoters of jazz as it's changing and morphing in the 1950s and 1960s. Ween creates the Newport Jazz Festival, New Orleans Jazz Festival, and jazz festivals around the world. One of the most important jazz critics, Nat Hentoff, grows up in Roxbury, begins his broadcasting career on WMEX, and also is an aspiring journalist at Northeastern. He writes, a jazz, writes about jazz for the Northeastern paper, and then spends 50 years as a music and cultural critic for the Village Voice in New York. And perhaps one of the most interesting entertainers from Boston, Eugene Walcott, was uh, from originally from the Caribbean, and was known as the Charmer for his Calypso songs until he becomes more entranced with the Nation of Islam and changes his name to Louis Farrakhan and moves to Chicago. So Boston has a very important jazz scene with jazz clubs in the South End along Columbus Ave and Mass Ave and jazz clubs in Copley Square under George Ween and jazz musicians and jazz teachers here, as Boston is close enough to New York so that musicians can take a break from New York or go back and forth between New York and Boston. Boston was an important place for the development of jazz, but it still was a city founded by the Puritans, and Boston still had blue laws, and in fact it had a licensing division with a city censor whose job was to make sure that nothing illicit was happening in the clubs. And one of the laws in Boston forbid any performances on Sunday. So at midnight on Saturday, the city censor would be able to shut down clubs that were still operating. At Storyville, one night in the early 1950s, George Ween saw that police officers were there to make sure the performance stopped at midnight so that the Sabbath would not be profaned. Sarah Vaughan was the performer that night. And at the stroke of midnight, he saw the police officers ready in case the show went on. So he said to Sarah Vaughan, sing the Lord's Prayer. She did a version of the Lord's Prayer. She had recorded it. 
And so as the police officers began moving to the stage, Sarah Vaughan began singing her inimitable version of the Lord's Prayer. And to listen to it, we understand why she was called the Divine One. The stunned police officers stopped as she sang it, thinking this isn't a performance, this is an act of worship. And they turned around and left, and the show went on. 